Delighted to introduce our speaker tonight. Michael Ardetti was educated at Rydal School where he was head boy and at Jesus College, Cambridge. He is a man of many parts. He is a prolific literary critic and an occasional broadcaster for the BBC. He has also been a theatre critic, notably for the London Evening Standard and for the Sunday Express. In his early career, between 1985 and 1991, he wrote plays for stage and radio, and four of his plays were broadcast on Radio 4. His first novel, The Celibate, was published in 1993. Since then, he's written a collection of short stories and 12 well-received novels many of which have been shortlisted and longlisted for various awards. His third novel, Easter, won the Waterstones Mardi Gras Award, and he was the Royal Literary Fund Fellow in 2001, and the Leverhulme Artist in Resident at the Freud, Freud Museum in 2008, and he has received Arts Council Awards in 2004 and 2007. In 2013, he was awarded the, an honorary doctorate of literature at the University of Chester. Much of Michael's writing explores issues of spirituality and sexuality, and Philip Pullman described him as our best chronicler of the rewards and pitfalls of present-day faith. His latest novel, however, of which we will be hearing more this evening, is a departure from these themes. The Young Pretender is based on the true story of a successful child actor in Regency England. William Betty and his battle to be taken seriously after his initial success and later scandalous fall from grace. One reviewer described the novel as a fresh and intriguing exploration of the fickleness of fame, which in our modern celebrity obsessed culture is aptly topical. I think we're in for an adventurous evening. And just to remind you, books are for sale and we've got it, you can buy them on the card, so that's no problem. So before we further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Ardetti. On my last visit to this city, so I'm know. just gonna use that for you. On my last visit to this city in 1806, the Abbey Bells pealed to celebrate my arrival. A band played beneath my window for the following morning, and Papa complained that they expected a perquisite. A lady of rank coaxed the hotel keeper into costuming her as a serving maid and setting her to wait at my table. I do not recall her name and doubt that she would thank me if I did. I was 14 years of age. I am six years older now, 10 inches taller, and my voice has acquired that mannish crack of which the poet wrote. Should my name spark a recollection, my figure swiftly dispels it, and I am able to enjoy the diversions of Bath unremarked. At eight each morning, I visit the pump room to take a draught of the water, which I am assured is salutary in despite of its taste. I tarry while the orchestra plays a selection of German airs before strolling to the coffee house where I read the newspapers, conversing with my fellow patrons on matters ranging from the war in Spain and the quakes in America to the building of Queen Charlotte's Orangery. I parry any question about the object of my visit with a casual allusion to physicians and cures. We then part company as they make their way to breakfast with friends, followed by a morning concert or a scientific lecture, a game of billiards or piquet in the assembly rooms, a ride or drive in the countryside, or a gentle promenade in the parades and arcades, while I go back to the hotel to address the business of the day. Well, that's the, those are the first two paragraphs of my novel, The Young Pretender, which deal with William Henry West Betty, um, who at 14 was probably the most celebrated person in England, um, apart from the royal family and Lord Nelson, and is now well, almost completely forgotten. Who was this child actor? 
Why was he acting on the country's major stages between the ages of 11 to 14? How good was he? What parts did he play? What did the other actors think of him? What became of him? And why did he become so completely forgotten? I first heard of him about 40 years ago when I went to an exhibition entitled The Georgian Playhouse at the Haywood Gallery. Um, amidst all the sort of rather grand uh, scenic designs and mock theatres, there was a screen dev devoted to Master Betty um, and full of caricatures because, of course, this was the golden age of the caricaturists. Um, there were caricatures of him by Cruikshank, Rowlandson, Gilray, all the names we know. Um, and amongst the rather, uh, he was a very innocent little boy figure in this, whereas there was a P Sheridan whom we probably think of just as a witty playwright and everything is presented as a hugely obese figure, which he, by then he'd become, and Kemble, the great actor of the day with his great Roman nose. But there is this innocent child in the middle of him. Was he in that, that innocent? One of the things I wanted to find out. Um, I discovered that at that time, he played some of the greatest roles that Shakespeare wrote, Romeo, Hamlet, Macbeth, Richard III, as well as a lot of roles in plays that are now thankfully forgotten. Tancred and Sigismunda, Gustavus Vava, the Royal Oak, the Earl of Essex, um, and one which you may know from your Jane Austen lover's vows. Um, so I tried to find out more about him. Um, and though another book has come out since called Betty Mania, um, there was actually only one book about him at the time. It was called The Prodigy by Giles Playfair. And he'd written it in the 1960s um, at the time of Beatlemania. And he was really looking at the fact that the only other time that there had been such extraordinary adulation of an audience for a performer was actually 150 years before for Master Betty. And it was no surprise that it was called um, Betty Mania. And he wasn't just an actor, he was a national celebrity in a way that we now take for granted, but wasn't so much then. He was merchandised in a big way. Um, all the women in the room would have had their Master Betty fans with pictures of him in various roles. Men would have had their Master Betty snuff boxes and uh, little girls particularly would have had cutouts of him and then you could dress him in various costumes. It's even worse than if you go to a big West End musical now and you get the cups and the T-shirts and everything else. It wasn't so much about the art, but the merchandising. Um, now, who was he? Uh, there were about 20 hagiographies, I use the word advisedly, written during this very short period of his fame, which was 1804 to 1806. And they all begin something like, our hero was born in Shrewsbury um, in on... I better remember this, the 13th of September, 1791. Um, his family was a sort of squirarchical family. That was quite rare because to go into the theatre at the time was you know, below the salt, as it were. Um, and he, his mother, Mary Stanton, was an heiress. She had a rather large estate called Hopton Waters um, in Shropshire, which his father, who is, I'm afraid, one of the villains of the piece, um, mortgaged up to the hilt. And so at a relatively young age, about the age of four, um, his father took them from Shropshire to Northern Ireland. Um, and that's where the facts of his life become murky. Um, and in fact, they, most of them are. Uh, he went to a place near Lisbon in Northern Ireland. And some of these hagiographers say that he went to say with his grandfather, who was a noted physician. Others say that his grandfather had an estate. Others say that his father went to set up a linen factory, which is what I've taken because it just becomes slightly more dramatic. And, and further, and some of the others just say he went to become a farmer. Um, but uh, the Irish connection was very important to the story uh, because uh, at the time, uh, as well as the, the being a, a war, the whole of the United Kingdom was at war with France and Bonaparte. And rather, as we've seen at the end of COVID, uh, people, theatre managers and things, needed something to attract uh, audiences to come out at a time of great national peril. But Ireland in particular was um, under threat because we just had Emmett's Rebellion 
and the theatres were all closed and there was still sporadic violence. And in order to get people to go out on an evening, they had to have something slightly more than usual. Um, but as soon as he'd gone to Britain, there became an, an attempt to divorce him from his Irish uh, origins because it was not really a thing. And in fact, you get one of, uh, one of the newspapers said, to render our narration as complete as possible, we shall commence with stating from the best authenticated documents that our hero is not, as has been reported, a native of Ireland, but owes his birth to the good soil of England. Um, now, the second, there was always an attempt to show him as both a natural young man, a boy, and also a prodigy. So there was a time to say, well, he actually enjoyed childhood games. He played with his toy soldiers. He um, presented um, some of the famous battles. And at the same time, um, also as this extraordinary child who was almost a gift from God. Uh, um, he developed this theatrical interest very young. Again, this, nobody really knows why and how. Some say that his mother and his mother's sisters, his aunts, played um, charades and put on scenes of plays in drawing rooms. Somebody even said that his mother was, had been a professional actress, and they got this reply. It has been repeatedly stated that Miss Stanton had been a performer on the public stage, or that she had been in the habit of acting in private theatres, neither of which reports, we are assured, has the smallest foundation in truth. Um, and you only have to remember how scathingly Fanny Bryce, sorry, Fanny Price, um, in Lover's Vows uh, is, is to the, towards the Crawfords when they, sorry, Fanny Price in Mansfield Park, is towards the Crawfords when they want to put on the play Lover's Vows to know just how people regarded the theatre um, as unsuitable for gentry to take part in. It was fine to go and see it on a public stage, uh, but not for anybody to actually take part in. Some people suggested that it was actually his father's love of Shakespeare that had uh, encouraged Master Betty to, to, in his theatrical pursuits. Um, I find that very hard to believe. His father was actually a champion fencer, so he might have helped him in the fifth act of Hamlet, but I don't think he helped him very much else. But one thing he did do was in 1802, he took him to the theatre in Belfast to see a production of Pizarro, um, which starred Mrs. Siddons. Um, nowadays, uh, actors of, of, of stature um, don't tour very much. Um, and famously, of course, a hundred years ago, and also a hundred years after Master Betty, Mrs. Patrick Campbell said, you know, I was a tour de force, I was never taught forced to tour. Um, but in, the, in those days, the London theatres, of which there were only two, were only two official ones anyway, the two um, theatres royal, at Drury Lane and at Covent Garden, they were only open for the London season. Um, the theatre in the Haymark, it was actually open during the summer, but it wasn't licensed to do legitimate plays. So the great actors of the day, Kemble, Mrs Siddons, Cook and Mrs Jordan, amongst many others, would make their progress through the country um, and would play often for one night only in theatres or taking home large fees. Um, Mrs Siddons, who was basically the Judy Dench of her day, and unparalleled at the time and regarded as, as the greatest actress perhaps Britain had ever produced, um, was the biggest draw of all. And she went to Belfast and she played the part of Elvira in Sheridan's play Pizarro. Sheridan, I think, now is best known for the two famous comedies, one of which is, of course, set in this city. Uh, but at the time, Pizarro was a much more successful play. It was based on a German play, and it was about um, Pizarro's uh, conquest of the Incas. But it had a more pertinent contemporary meaning for people than that, because, of course, again, it was the war against Bonaparte. And the Incas were seen as the brave British people fighting against the might of Bonaparte's empire. Um, and there was a particular character called Rolla, uh, which actually Master Betty played to huge acclaim later. 
uh, who had a speech, which was a very famous speech, in which he encouraged um, his own tribe to fight against um, Bonaparte. And um, when Master Betty played it, it was particularly successful because it was seen as the youth of England arising against the tyrant. Well, um, Mrs. Siddons played the part of Elvira, and Elvira was Pizarro's mistress. But during the course of the play, as in all good melodramas, she changed sides and actually betrayed him to the Incas. And then Pizarro put her to death. And this is the speech that she gives um, just as she is being led off to death, which gives some idea of A, the effect it had, well, I'm not Mrs. Siddons, but the effect it had on Master Betty, but also the extraordinary rhetorical cadences of the time, which are sometimes quite difficult to follow. Um, so this is Elvira. Soldiers, but a moment more. It is to applaud your general. It is to tell the astonished world that for once, Pizarro's sentence is an act of justice. Yes, rack me with the sharpest tortures that ever agonize the human frame. It will be justice. Yes, bid the minions of thy fury wrench forth the sinews of those arms that have caressed and even have defended thee. Approach me bound on the abhorred wheel. There glut thy savage eyes of the convulsive spasms of that dishonored bosom which was once thy pillow. Yet will I bear it all, for it will be justice all. And when thou shalt bid them tear me to my death, hoping that thy unshrinking ears may at last be feasted with the music of my cries, I will not utter one shriek or groan, but to the last gasp, my body's patience shall deride thy vengeance as my soul defies thy power. And that was precisely the sort of speeches, not obviously as Elvira, that Master Betty was giving in some of those plays that are forgotten. Pizarro is now unreadable, but it was a huge, huge success at the time. So I can turn the sound down. <laughs> oh God, it's it's gone. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll carry on. Um, um, but um, the... Um, the apocryphal story of the time is that Master Betty saw this and went home going, I shall die if I be not a player. Um, well, he didn't die, but a year following, he was himself a professional actor. So what happened? How did this at the time, 11 year old boy, become an actor? And you, I think you can look at it in one word or two words, um, William Hoff. Hoff was a prompter. Um, with the main theatre in Belfast, the King's Theatre in Belfast. Uh, but the theatres, of course, were closed. And somehow he met Miss, Miss, Mr. Betty, the father. Um, in my novel, I make it at the races because where Master Betty, who lived with his parents, was quite close to the main race course at the time. And um, Mr. Betty, as we discover later, is an inveterate gambler. Um, and But a prompter was a much, much more important role in the theatre than he might be now. Um, he was effectively the director. Uh, he, together with the leading actor, would arrange how he wanted the actors to stand. He would make out their parts, which were called lengths. Actors didn't see the whole play. They were just given their parts and their cues. And it said, you know, quite often actors didn't know if they were appearing in comedies or tragedies because they just had their own parts on it. Um, the first stage director of, of any note was actually the Duke of Saxe Meinigen in Germany in the 1850s. He had his own private theatre and his own private troupe of actors. Uh, but before that, it was just a role that was totally unknown. So he, Hoff wasn't just um, a, a prompter, though perhaps being a prompter at the time was rather more significant again than one hopes it is now, because lots of the actors, including, for example, Cook, whom I've mentioned, often turned up drunk. It was said of Cook that um, half his part had been played in the prompt corner. Um, and other, others, of course, because of the extraordinary turnaround of plays, um, wouldn't know their lines terribly well. But he met Master, um, Mr. Betty, um, and... He saw something in the boy at the time um, which attracted him hugely. 
The nature of that attraction is something I, I'd like to look at a little bit better, but whether it was talent, whether it was beautiful, beauty, and one has to remember, uh, which is quite crucial, that Master Betty was an extraordinarily beautiful boy. Um, and um, he talked to his theatre manager, a man called Michael Atkins, uh, about um, Master Betty. And according to the, the, bill, the, the bill that was posted outside the theatre and then the notice that was put in the newspapers, um, Michael Atkins was, was persuaded somewhat reluctantly to give the boy a chance. And this is what he said. A young gentleman of this neighbourhood, only 11 years of age, having given such striking proof of a wonderful genius in theatrical oratory that the most critical judges have pronounced him a phenomenon of the age, Mr Atkins, anxious to gratify the lovers of the drama to the utmost of his powers, has, through the intercession of several ladies, prevailed on the young gentleman's friends to permit his performing two or three of the characters he most excels in. And again, it's significant that he referred into that as into ladies, because there was already, even at the very beginning, a certain ambiguity about Master Betty's attraction, and it was felt safer to mention the ladies rather than the gentlemen. Um, and he, his first role um, was, as, was as, um, and I can't even find it, his first role was, was a Selim in a, in a play called Barbarossa, which again is completely forgotten. Many of these plays at the time were set in what we now call the Middle East, um, because that was seen as quite exotic. Um, and it was a tremendous success, at least according to the hagiographers, to the puffs. Um, and there was a much, I was a theatre critic for a time, and I was completely and utterly incorrupt, incorruptible. But at the time, in, in the um, early 19th century, that was not the case. There was a very fine line between what was called a theatrical puffery and theatrical criticism. Um, and uh, you could basically pay for what looked like a review to be put in paper. Um, but it was said at the time, uh, of, he became an overnight success. The applauses were, of course, tumultuous and incessant. The actors of the company were confounded to see themselves completely schooled by a mere infant. I bet they were. Um, the next day, little Betty formed the common topic of conversation in all parts of the town. And very swiftly, he went on to play Roller in Pizarro, um, Norval in Douglas, which became I'll say, his most famous role, and Romeo. Um, and his fame spread. He then went on to, to Dublin, um, where he had a tremendous reception. And here are just some of the reviews that came out of that. And this is an untried boy in only his second theatrical engagement. So wonderful a collection of natural powers never have been witnessed in so young a creature. That was the Dublin Journal. Literally astonished the audience. This most wonderful boy, so perfect and interesting an exhibition has not been witnessed in many years. That was the Dublin Evening Post. Drenched the audience in tears. That was the Dublin Evening News. The audience seemed sometimes as if lost in wonder. No difficulty can be felt in slating this youthful performer's vast pretensions to the title of the Infant Rossius. And that was the Freeman's Journal. Um, and that's the most significant of all, because very shortly after that, Master Betty became known as the young Rossius. Um, people who remember Hamlet uh, may remember the exchange between Hamlet and Polonius when the players come to Elsinore and when Ros Rossius was an actor in Rome. And Rossius was the great act classical actor, the actor of classical times. And Garrick, who had died just over 30 years before Master Betty's debut, had been known as the English Rossius. Garrick was a national hero in a way that no actor, a middle-aged elderly actor, has been ever since. I mean, even Olivier, um, because the theatre was the only game in town, uh, the only game in the country. Um, and when he died, it was felt that a whole sort of tradition had, had died with him. Um, he was known as the great natural actor. Now, being a natural actor then was not what we would see as a natural actor now. It was believed when you were acting 
that there were specific uh, gestures and expressions to define particular emotions, um, be it sorrow, anger, pity, fear, love. And you just had to do that in the same way as you had to say your lines. And Garrick did just as much as anybody else. But what he did do, from what one can read, was that he expressed those attitudes, they were called attitudes, more swiftly, more fleetingly between them than any other actor had done. So it wasn't that he was more natural, but that he was quicker about it, if you like. Um, and you only have to see some of the famous pictures of him. I can't do it because of my stick, but there's a very famous picture of him, and I think it may be by Zophany, before the Battle of Bosworth. And he is standing there, he's sitting there doing this. Um, and I mean, you know, that would not have got him much applause today. And um, in my novel, uh, Kemble, who was seen as the antithesis of Gary, uh, when he's being sneered at for not being a natural actor like Gary, mentions what was strictly true, that Garrick had a wig when he was playing Hamlet uh, with a little cord here. And when he saw the ghost, he would pull it. And so his hair would stand on end. Um, and um, as Campbell in, in my novel I says, you know, was that natural? Um, but anyway, he, that's how he was seen. Now, Campbell, who was his successor, um, as, as it were, the great actor of his time, was a completely different sort of figure. He was a very academic figure. He did huge research into his roles. Um, we might admire him for that now. They didn't admire him so much there. He was seen as very slow. And his great roles were roles that didn't actually change in their passions. They were always kept on one level. Addison's Cato was one, and Shakespeare's Coriolanus, which is obviously a great role, but doesn't actually have the swings of passions of some of the others. And he was very laboured in his delivery. Sheridan famously said that you could actually play music during his pauses. Um, so there was a great sense that a lot had been lost. And so the puffing of Master Betty, this boy who was a natural actor because he was a child, and one must remember it was also the time of William Blake and romanticism and the innocence and the naturalness of childhood. He was seen as the antithesis of Kemble. Um, we see how Kemble takes his revenge later for that. But also um, he was seen as the heir to Gap. And so by the time he arrived, he went from... Um, Northern Ireland, but from Dublin, he went back through Cork and then to various places in Northern Ireland. And then he went to Scotland and he had this triumph um, in Edinburgh and Glasgow. And one of the roles he had a particular triumph was a role I've actually already mentioned. It was Young Norval in Douglas. And of all the non-Shakespearean plays I've mentioned, um, Douglas is the only one I feel that could ever be revived. It was indeed revived, apparently, at the Glasgow Citizens Theatre in the 1960s. Um, it's, it's similarly melodramatic. Um, the part that um, Betty played was young Norval. He had been brought up as a shepherd boy, but of course, actually, he was the son of the Lord, so he didn't know this. Um, and he, and he finds himself on the estate talking to the woman who turns out to be his mother. Um, and the villain of the piece, Glen Alvin, um, sees them and considers, uh, assumes they're having a love affair. Um, the discrepancy in ages, even when it's not Master Betty, we have to pass over rather quickly. Um, and he tells uh, Lord Randolph, who is the, um, the, the, the wife, the husband of Lady Randolph, and there are lots of, that, uh, lots of fights ensue, and most of the cast end up dead, and Lady Randolph ends up mad. Um, but uh, it was a, a role to which Betty was very, very suited. And in fact, the greatest of the many portraits of him at the time, which is now in the National Portrait Gallery, which was by Opie, um, is of him as young Norval. It's the most wonderful portrait. And you can see in that, he, he's standing there, the staff. You can see the measure, his, his great dignity there. And also, you can also, as I've mentioned, see his great attraction. The quatrain with which he came on stage, became very, very famous. My name is Norval. On the Grampian Hills, my father feeds his flocks. A frugal swain whose constant cares were to increase his store and keep his only son, myself, at home. Um, and it's rather less doggerel than a lot of them. Um, 
And Douglas was a very famous play at the time. Again, Jane Austen mentions it in Mansfield Park. Um, George Eliot mentions it in The Mill on the Floss. Obviously, it's a bit later, 40 years later. And Dickens mentions it in Nicholas Nickleby. And I might have a, a little aside there um, in saying that the infant phenomenon um, the, in, in the Crumbles company in Nicholas Nickleby um, is said to have been inspired in part by Betty, though she was A, older than he was, uh, and B, um, clearly not as clever and competent. Um, and Douglas was also a rallying point for the Scots. When it was first performed in Edinburgh, 40 years before Betty took the role, um, somebody stood up in the audience and went, where be your Willie Shakespeare now? Um, and John Holm, who wrote the play, was still alive. He was a very old man when Betty played it, and he said he was the best representative of the role he'd ever seen. So after Scotland, Betty moved through the, through the north of England, um, and it was tumultuous. And somehow crowds who'd never seen him before lined the roads, country roads, to see his carriage passed. Um, and it just became a sort of... And just an endless roller coaster. Um, he went to Liverpool. They had to bring out the troops um, to keep the crowds who were going to the, trying to break into the theatre who couldn't get in. People died trying to get in to see his play and perform. In Sheffield, rather, as I mentioned in Bath uh, at the beginning, um, they sounded the church bells when he arrived um, and tried to organise a petition to the Lord Mayor to prevent him leaving. Town, so he would just perform there endlessly, um, sort of Scheherazade figure. Um, in Leicester, he played what was called a morning performance and an evening performance. The morning performance, of course, is how, why we have the word matinee, um, and an evening performance on the same day, two different plays. This was completely unheard of, and this was still a boy of 12. Um, but the place I'd like to take us to on this long journey down to London is Birmingham. Um, his roles there were pretty similar. His reception there was as ecstatic as everywhere else. But the manager of the Birmingham Theatre was a man called William McCready. And his son later became the, the great celebrated actor of the mid-Victorian age, William Charles McCready. Um, and he is the only person of Betty's own age that one reads about um, Betty actually having any dealings with. They played boyish things. They climbed to the flies in the gallery, uh, in the, in, in, above the stage. And apparently there were absolute hysterics in case, you know, what, what the man that, uh, the boy that Sheridan described as the goose that laid the golden eggs would actually fall down and the eggs would break. Um, they, he and McCready, who had a very jaundiced eye to his fellow performers, he always regarded having gone into the theatre as something beneath him and most of the players, as even further beneath that, always had good words to say about Betty in later life. Um, and I think that's important when we ask, as, as people did ask, was he actually any good as an actor to remember that MacReady did rate him? Um, and it was in Birmingham that the London managers came to see him and the uh, really fight for him to behave, to perform there took place. Um, the two theatres I mentioned before, Covent Garden and Drury Lane. Drury Lane was in the hands of Sheridan. Um, one has, as I said, this image of Sheridan as somebody who wrote The Rivals and the School for Scandal and witty and charming and eloped with Eliza Lumley and all the rest of it. But by this point, he was actually uh, mainly, his ambitions were theater, was political. He was a major Whig politician. He was a manager of Drury Lane. And he um, exploited that. He, he drained the coffers in order to fund his political stuff. Um, and he was completely venal. He paid um, Kemble and Mrs. Siddons when they were working there and Mrs. Jordan because he had to pay the stars. And he didn't pay the supernumeraries and the carpenters. And famously, he moved his, his um, office down to the ground floor so he could jump out of the window when anybody came asking for money. Um, he was not the most sort of salubrious character, if you like. Kemble had left him and had gone to work for, um, um, I forget, a man called Harris, Thomas Harris at, at Covent Garden, and he was the manager. And it, it galled him, he was the one who had to go up to Birmingham to see 
um, Master Betty perform and to try and engage his services for Covent Garden. It's said that he coughed all the way through his performance. Um, and Kemble managed to secure his services. Sheridan, however, thought this would be the absolute ruination of his theatre and found a, a, a loophole in the clause that said that when the, 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 it wasn't an exclusive um, contract, so that when uh, Betty was not performing at Covent Garden, he could perform at Drury Lane. And so this boy was performing alternate nights at Covent Garden and Drury Lane, which was completely unheard of. He also performed for staggering fees. He was offered 50 guineas a night, which I'm told in terms of actually what it bought then was more than any stage actor has been paid ever since then. And to give you one example, Kemble, who was by far the best paid actor in England and was also a manager, was only paid 37 pounds, 10 shillings a week. Um, the fact that his father then went through most of this fortune um, is incidental to that. Um, he arrived in London, and I think it's time for another piece of dog war, um, of which there were many written about him, uh, because this just gives you an idea of the fact that everybody was waiting for this boy. What sounds confused my ears? From priests, from poets, actors, peers, what mania fills the town? Smiles, greetings, salutations all. One buzz of joy amongst great and small. The world sure upside down. Oh, bless my heart, old Levy cries. Dear me, the Christian miss replies. Ben Block too aids the clatter. Huzzas augment the swelling tide. Pleasure prevails on every side. John Bull cries, what's the matter? The matter, John, thy ears stretch wide. Thy wig straight, whate'er betide, the bar thy news shall tell. To gain the truth he has contrived, no Master Betty's just arrived at Richardson's Hotel. And it wasn't satire. The hotel was besieged. They had to put um, rushes down on the cobbles when he wasn't well, in case the number of carriages came to inquire about him, um, actually disturbed him. They put bulletins on the railings, which uh, doctors put daily bulletins of his state of health. He just used it overtired, um, which had not, was only ever done with, for the royal family. Um, so it was this complete sensation. And in December the 1st, 1804, just a couple of months after his 13th birthday, he made his debut at Covent Garden, once again in Barbarossa. He played a part of Selim, um, Salim doesn't appear until the second act. I'm told by my actor friends that it's rather good if you don't appear until a bit after a play has begun because people are talking about you. And if you're a well-known actor, people are waiting for you. In this case, it wasn't so good for the other actors because they couldn't be heard. Um, the whole of the first act, people were just waiting for Master Betty to appear and chattering amongst themselves. Um, and then he did appear and caused, as I said, a sensation. Um, such a triumph that uh, James Northcote, a painter who painted the other most famous painter, painting of, of Betty, um, and the a one he appears in my novel quite a lot, uh, wrote, he and Bonaparte now divide the world, and others saw no rival in, even in the French Empire, Emperor. The Morning Post wrote, the war and Bonaparte were for a time unheeded and forgotten. And Lady Elizabeth Foster, soon to be the um, Duchess of Devonshire, spoke for many when she wrote, I saw him last night as Norval in Douglas. He is but 13, and yet I never saw anything to compare to him. He is the inspiration of genius, with feeling beyond his years and a knowledge of the stage equal to any performer and far more graceful. In short, he has changed the life of London. People dine at four, go to the play and think of nothing but the play. And this unparalleled celebrity continued for two seasons. He was fated by the royal family. The Prince of Wales, who later became the Prince Regent, gave him a private tour of his great house, the Mal uh, um, Carlton House. Um, his brother, the Duke of Clarence, later to be William IV, who of course was having a, uh, a long affair with, the, with Mrs. Jordan, the great comedienne, who bore him 10 children and then he uh, terribly, cruelly abandoned her in, in order to marry a German princess. 
But he and Mrs. Jordan took um, Master Betty to stay for two weeks at their house, Bushy House. Duchess is vied to um, drive with him in Hyde Park. Uh, he had to go and play after long performances. He was expected to go and recite at people's soirees, um, one of which he was the other um, performer was Emma Hamilton, uh, Lady um, Lord Nelson's mistress. And uh, he did, she did her famous attitudes in which she represented figures from classical mythology. And she was so uh, attracted to Betty that she grabbed him and held him very close to her very powdered bosom, which again, one of the few of his authentic remarks we have where he said, I'm too old to be kissed. Um, and not that something that quite a few of her lovers had said. Um, but the whole of society uh, was after him. Uh, and just after this meteoric rise, he had a merciless fall. Um, what were the reasons for this? Uh, partly there, his father. His father was very, very exploitative. He um, took all the, the money his son could get. He drugged his son. It's known that he gave him pills and rum in order to perform after uh, he'd been on stage to the poem at the private soirees. And anybody who knows sort of stories of Hollywood child actors like Judy Garland can see that Master Betty was really the prototype celebrity like that. And incidentally, there are also calls for Lord Eldon, who was the Lord Chancellor, to put him under his wing as a ward. And again, the recent case of Britney Spears being made a ward of court um, shows again this thing, I guess, as it recurs. Um, but so his father was very, very jealous of Hoff. Um, he didn't like the idea that somebody was actually um, instrumental in his son's success. Um, and I think Hoff was absolutely critical. I, I think it's clear that Betty had great natural talent. Let's say a second. But um, he clearly had to be taught. And I have a couple of lines in my, my novel. I don't know if they're authentic, but they seem authentic to me, in which um, Master Betty, he's now older, is looking back on his childhood and remembering Hoff and goes, I realize that without intending it, I have echoed not just the cadences of Mr. Hoff's speech, but the tones of his voice. Tones drummed into my consciousness until they rang in my ears each time I stepped out on the stage. Um, and he started to play parts for which he wasn't suited. Now, you might say that he really wasn't suited to play any of the parts he played in terms of age. But whereas you can just about see a boy 13 play um, Hamlet, I suppose it's really not any less remarkable than Ian McKellen playing it at 80, uh, where well, he's supposed to be a student, and Romeo, who was a, a youth, um, to play Richard III and Macbeth, which were parts that really weren't big in his range, but also um, didn't make the use of what was his natural attraction, um, with Richard III particularly supposed to look deformed. That didn't go down well. Um, and Master, Mr. Betty took over the teaching of his son himself. And then there is what we have to look at, the more sinister aspect of his appeal, which, and there was clearly a paedophiliac um, att attraction. Um, when Hoff was dismissed by Master, Mr. Betty, so I get my masters and misters muddled up. When Hoff was dismissed by Mr. Betty, there was a caricature in the Morning Post, and it said, wanted dramatic tutor to the young Rossius. Um, and underneath it said, for I've a wondrous rod in pickle, your pretty little bum to tickle. Um, well, you can't get much more explicit than that in an early 19th century newspaper. Um, and there was one particular character who was called Thomas Lister Parker, who had the wonderful title of the bow bearer of the forest of Boland, which apparently is an office older than that of Earl Marshall. And he saw um, Master Betty, first of all, in Liverpool and followed him round the country put his fortune at his disposal, and more specifically at his father's disposal, um, and got all his friends to, to come, these very influential sort of aesthetic men, um, but also quite clearly demanded more from Master Betty than Master Betty was prepared to give, or indeed should have given, and turned against him and turned a lot of fashionable society against him. Um, and that was significant. Um, but the women too uh, felt for him hugely. 
in according to the ladies monthly magazine of january 1805 they, a woman wrote, female beauty cannot afford anything more sweet than his smile. The whole town is in love with him. Northcote, the painter I've already mentioned, wrote rather disparagingly in his diary of the way his father opened the, his dressing room to men of fashion to come and watch him change. His dressing room was crowded as full as it could, as full as if it could contain all the court of England. And happy were those who could get in at the time that his father was rubbing his naked body from the perspiration after the exertion in performing his part on the stage. Well, that's as close to child abuse, I feel, as you can get. And it was noted at the time. The Times, in a 4th of December 1804, very shortly after his debut, Master Betty's success is very naturally the cause of much envy and heartbreak among the Master Pollys and Master Jennies of Bond Street and Cheapside, who in all their attempts to distinguish their pretty persons and effeminate airs have only miscarried. And those um, Master Jennies and uh, Master Pollys were rent boys. Um, and it must have been very, very humiliating if he knew that, and he certainly knew that later in life, to know that that was how he was perceived. Um, so we have a boy who is no longer being tutored by the man who really helped him. We have his friends who have turned against him. We have the fact that he is now at the age of 14, um, attaining puberty, which came later in those years, in those days. And so his natural attraction, he's getting heavier, he's getting hair on his upper lip, um, and he's getting bigger and broader, and that sort of ethereal grace so many people mention is losing him. And that's where Kemble, uh, moved in for the kill. Excuse me a moment. He didn't do so directly. He didn't do so directly. He did it by stealth. He cast a very young girl of seven who lisped, whose baby teeth had fallen out and whose uh, other teeth hadn't grown, is the title role in a play called The Country Girl, which was Garrick's bowglerized version of Witchley's wonderful restoration comedy, um, The Country Wife. But at that time, it was regarded as, as, as too bawdy for the more refined tastes of the late 18th, early 19th century. But Kemble certainly gave us back the indecency by casting this seven-year-old girl uh, whose lover um, had to crawl on his hands and knees in order to kiss her. Um, he gave us a confident, the tallest actress in the company, and if that weren't enough, he gave her a two foot high ostrich feather um, uh, hat. Um, and the girl was, was booed off the stage and her understudy had to come on and take it over. Uh, but it was known that though it was obviously Miss Muddy, that was, sorry, I don't know if I mentioned she was called Miss Muddy, not her most happy name. Um, though she was the one that was being attacked actually on stage, it was aimed at Master Betty. Because once you'd said, look at how terribly ju juvenile performances are devaluing our art, it was very easy to move from the one to the other. Um, fashion proved its fickleness. Uh, he was not hired for a third season. Um, he, he, he went round the country for another couple of years, uh, playing quite successfully in the provinces, being billed increasingly inappropriately as Mr. Master Betty, and then he played his last performance once again at the Theatre Royal here on March the 18th, 1808. Um, and he went to Cambridge. Again, people went, he was 16 at the time, went earlier. We know very little about his Cambridge career, except that he, his great friend there was a man called Harness, who was the boy that, well, as a boy, was the one Bar um, Byron was in love with at Harrow. And I should also mention that Byron went into raptures over Master Betty, and then in typical Byronic way, once he fell from fortune, said he was the biggest charlatan ever. Um, and, but he didn't take his degree. He went back to Shropshire because his father was dying. And then he took over his father, he took over his estate, which was actually his. It had been bought with his earnings. And he seemed to settle into the life of a country squire. We know that he practiced archery. He became a captain in the yeomanry. But clearly this was not enough for a man who knew the, you know, the applause of thousands. Um, and he tried to make a comeback. 
and he began, as I said, his comeback here at the age of 20. Um, and that's where my novel begins. Um, it certainly didn't end happily. There were two suicide bits, um, one which Giles Playfair described and one which was attempt to sit his throat and one which I discovered, and as far as I can see, nobody else ever did because I was in the British Museum looking for, for a wonderful thing called the Annals of Old Drury. And um, they referred to this. I'm not going to say what it is because I hope people will get the book and see. Um, but um, he didn't succeed in his suicide attempts. And he lived on until the age of 82, almost 60 years after his trial. And it seemed he lived a very happy country life after discovering that he really couldn't recreate his youthful triumphs. But the most extraordinary thing is that he put his own son on the stage at the age of 15. And you, um, why had he forgotten or indeed repressed the memories? And that's, again, something I particularly consider, the nature of his memories of his childhood. Or was he trying to redeem himself? And Henry did go on to have a moderately successful um, career, but um, he was always known as the son of the young Rossius, which can't have gone very well. Um, and one of the, as I put it here in the book, one question above all gnaws at my brain. This is Master Betty speaking, or Mr. Betty now. Was I a prodigy equipped by nature to play characters of every stamp, or a youth of rare ability who had come into my own when I was of age? my heart more conversant and figure more congruent of the passions I portrayed. If the former, I may already have attained my meridian. If the latter, my second incarnation will transcend my first. And sadly, that second incarnation didn't transcend the first. Um, but was he a good actor? Um, I think, I think he must have been. Um, Audiences weren't that forgiving. He could certainly obviously make himself heard. Both Covent Garden and Drury Lane were bigger auditoria than they are now. And if he hadn't been uh, able to make himself heard to the people in the amphitheatre, what we now call the gods, they would have thrown fruit, they threw, they threw dead fowl and all sorts of horrible things. They're, that's not the case at all. They were queuing to get in. Um, McCready certainly thought he was a great actor. Um, and also, um, acting, as I said, was very different in those days. You didn't have to interiorize the, the, the parts the way that actors would now. Um, it was rather more like opera. Uh, what you have a wonderful, uh, one of the few surviving Georgian playhouses in this city. Um, and the actors would really only act on the proscenium stage. There would have been doors to now, I think, removed, if I remember rightly. And they would do all, all the acting there. And the vast part of the stage was just used for scenic effects. And the, the um, subsidiary actors, they only seen themselves at, um, would basically form a circle, a semicircle, round the leading actor. And in fact, it's really what opera was um, 30 or 40 years ago. What one friend described to me is what they used to call it, park and bark. Um, and you would just go there and do your bit and leave. Um, and that's why these actors like Mrs. Siddons were able to go and perform in all these uh, theatres uh, during the summer where they hadn't rehearsed at all. They would just say, I will stand here, don't get in my way, don't get down. So, and that was what it was. So he was able to do that. It wasn't quite as incongruous as it would be now. And I think MacReady's judgment is the most Im important of all. Um, that MacReady valued his, his judgment and so did um, uh, Hazlitt, who was the finest drama critic of the day. He wrote, um, Master Betty's acting was a singular phenomenon, but it was also as beautiful as it was singular. He seemed almost like some gay creature of the elements, moving about gracefully with all the flexibility of youth and murmuring aeolian sounds with plaintive tenderness. So I think it's history has treated him badly in so far as it's treated him at all. When I embarked on writing The Young Pretender, um, I spoke to many friends, and many of them in the theatre who had never heard of him. I hope to some extent they've heard him, obviously they've heard of him through my particular now um, way of looking. And because of that, I'd like to end, I've quoted quite a few pieces of doggerel. I'd like to, to end with a piece of my own doggerel. 
Um, Master Betty was at a soiree, and we know that a figure of Britannia came on, came and crowned him with laurel leaves. Uh, this was at the height of his fame. Um, we don't know what she said, so this is how I'd like to leave it. It is dogged. Since days of yore, or Britain's shore, I e'er have cast mine eye to guard her laws, uphold her cause, and guide her destiny. Her history bold on every page is my delight to read, and on the glory of her stage my heart doth ever feed. And so, in this o'erclouded hour, with danger ever near, a hero have I sent with power each loyal heart to cheer. A little child, an angel fair, graced with the muse's fire, a prodigy beyond compare, his country to inspire. And when at last this war with France is gloriously won, the soldiers too will have the chance to cheer my favourite son. And none will clap as loud as they, their wounds they count at naught, their joy to see young Rossius play worth every fight they fought. Would you like, would you take some questions? Yes. Yes. Has anybody got any questions? Yes. Could you speak that way? Is that okay? Hi. I was wondering um, about his voice, which wouldn't have been broken, which wouldn't have broken, presumably, at the time that he was at the height of his fame. And, you know, if you were playing Macbeth and Richard III, I would have come across quite strangely, I would think, if he had the voice of a girl, effectively. Um, his voice broke just at the time, was part, I think, of his fall from grace. Because, yes, no, he, he, he exactly that. He was, um, he, he hadn't, he broke, voices broke later in those days. Um, and I think, as I, I said at the very beginning, that manish crack, it was before that had happened. And yes, it would have seemed very incongruous. But then so uh, several of the parts he played were martial parts, Barbarossa, Gustavus Vasa, the Earl of Essex. And nobody seemed to have mind. Um, he certainly had, he must have had a, a high-pitched voice. Um, but the, the, he, he clearly managed to make people believe in him because though there may have been some puffery, and there clearly was, um, the fact that you know, we talk about, you know, um, folie à deux, but it can't have been folly at the whole country. Um, and um, so, yes, I think he had this extraordinary power to draw people to him. But his voice he hadn't, his, his voice breaking was part of the problem. And in fact, the, I haven't said, the, the, the Thomas Sister Parker figure uh, and others actually referred to this, this ugliness that had suddenly appeared in his speaking. Any other questions? Um, I think this lady. Yeah, why did you call the book the young pretender? Well, it's a, a sort of pun. Um, acting is to some extent pretense, and he was also the pretender to the, you know, the, the dramatic throne, the throne that Gary had had and that Kemble had. Um, so it was quite simply that, really. Uh, it's, um, yes, titles are always a difficult thing. Um, I, somebody once said that a good title is the title of a good book. Uh, but in this case, I dislike the idea of the, the, the playing on, slight playing on words. See, like, after this. Yes, I said he died at 82. Um, and a, apart from putting his son on the stage, um, well, his son was 15. Uh, he married, he married a, a Shropshire woman um, who we know absolutely nothing about. Uh, and he he um, went back to live in, once his son had success, uh, was moderate, he went back to live in Shropshire. Um, we hear of him sometimes of presiding at country fairs. There's one rather poignant moment where if, if you were a star actor, you were given the right to, to go on, be on the Covent Garden Drury Lane free list for life. He was very rich. But he turned up at the pit door and he wasn't given access. 
And he writes a letter to Macready, who he knew of old, saying, you know, and it begins, I hope I didn't embarrass anybody by assuming I had a place on the free list, which of course he should have had. And Macready immediately reinstates it and gets another thing. And he died, um, as I said, 82, which was a, a good age then, and he's buried in Highgate Cemetery with his wife and son um, in the Old Park Cemetery, rather, well, almost all those um, monuments there are pretty tumble down. Uh, but it seems he had a relatively benign old age, um, as far as one knows. Any other questions? In the book, Mike, did you paint a picture of him really being quite a threat, being exhausted and taken out in the evenings, not really knowing how to behave on those kind of sensual occasions? Even is there a hint of him being picked out by his father? I, I don't know. Well, not, not I mean, yeah, I, I, that of course is, is my imagination of what it was like for a boy having played Hamlet or roles of that length. Um, and the performances went on a long time because the intermissions were long as well, because it's such a social occasion. Then having to go out uh, and act, well, in fact, recite, you usually recite speeches to audiences of very grand people, um, having been given this rum and pills, I would be pretty depressed. Um, but I, um, well, when I was that age, I was, um, and I, 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 yeah, I mean, his father, if, if, to have his, you know, to say, come into my, you know, come and watch my naked son being dried, um, because, you know, uh, and, and have all these men staring at you, um, when you're 13 and probably very, well, and you're 13, self-conscious or whatever, um, I would, yes, I, I, that's just my interpretation of it. I can't imagine he found this very uh, welcoming and attractive. I think very unlikely, um, because he turned against Master Betty and his father saying that they were very, very ungrateful. This is the bow bearer of the forest of Boland. Um, and um, he was a really reprehensible character. Actually, rather, he went through his family fortune um, buying extraordinary um, paintings from Germany and all this sort of thing, and things that, of the aristocrats who'd been uh, executed in the revolution, and then everything had to be sold off, including these portraits of Betty, which are now in the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, but I don't, think, uh, I don't think so. I mean, it's certainly not on record. It is on record as I stated here, that he was perceived in newspapers and things as having a sexual allure for men. Um, and that's as far as they went. Any other questions? He was obviously very famous in his time and you found a lot written about him. Where, where did you manage to do most of your research? And the, the British Library. Uh, I'm also a member of the London Library, which of course is a private lending library, and some of the these little hagiographies were available there, but very few. I mean, there's nothing, there were these, about 20 of these, um, some were quite long and some were written when he was 13 and 14, purporting to be the stories of his life, and they're all enormously, our hero does this, our hero does that. There's no attempt at a perspective. Um, and then there was one particular biography written in about 1846, I think, I may have got the date slightly wrong, which was when his son um, had started to have a bit of fame, nothing like this. I mean, it's an ordinary actor's fame, and it brought back some memories of him. Um, but that, those, are the, those are the primary sources. Then there was this book by Giles Playfair, which came out in the 60s, and then much more recently, a book called Betty Mania, which was very interesting for me, but not actually particularly a creative impulse for me because it's more about the merchandising of him and the way that went on. But the London, you know, the British Library has almost everything. Um, and then there are, of course, wonderful caricatures, um, uh, a couple of which I managed to obtain myself. So um, there they are. Um, Any other questions? Could, could you tell us about the 
There were some some remarks about the fact that he had a feminine name. And when I started talking about him to people who didn't know, they thought I was talking about some sort of drag artist. Um, but no, he 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 didn't. He became huge, fast when he did become very fat. Yes, and I again used that as I thought it was a defense. You know, if you are, if you feel you have been admired for your looks rather than your talent. Um, one of the ways you might actually, this is a, me as sort of psychotherapist rather than me as researcher, but one of the ways you might escape that is by making yourself fat so nobody is going to love you for your looks. You know, um, the trouble is for an actor, the looks are part of your, two of your trades, it didn't help. Okay. I think, I think there's one question which comes to mind when you well, thank you very much. That's really interesting. I think we're all going to start looking and see, see if we can find a bit more about it. I certainly am. Anyway, do look at the book because um, it's you can get it on the car, so you don't have to have cash to buy it. So it's, thank you yeah. very much. That was it. And I am going to out shortly, but if anybody would like to sign me to sign it, I can do that before I go. Thank you. Thank you very much.